Uh, so welcome to the Writer Center's virtual craft chat series, where we talk with writers a little less about what they wrote and a little more uh, about how they wrote it. Um, my name is Zach Powers. I'm the Artistic Director of the Writer Center, and it's my pleasure now to introduce our host for the evening, Tara Campbell, who is an amazing author of many books, who is an instructor at the Writer Center, and is currently our Vice Chair of the Board of Directors at the Writer Center, among too many other things to list. Uh, and Tara, you're one of my favorite people. Dave, you are one of my favorite authors too. So let's just get started with this event. I'm gonna sit back and, and enjoy, and this will be a lot of fun. So thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for having me in various capacities. Like no matter how I wanna get involved at the Writer Center, they're like, sure, come on over. So tonight I am very pleased to be introducing Dave's latest novel to the world. Um, and I thought I'd start just with a little intro to Dave. I'm sure, I'm guessing most of you already know him very well, but um, he, he, this intro bears repeating. Um, so I will just go ahead and introduce Dave Housley and uh, the, the novel we're gonna be talking about tonight, the other ones is his third novel. Um, he's also the author of two other novels, actually, yes, two other novels and four story collections. Uh, his work has appeared in Booth, Hobart, Quarterly Rest, Quarterly West, Redivider, tell me if I've mangled that title, and some other places. He's one of the founding editors and all around do stuff people at Barrel House, and he tweets at Housley Dave. Um, and I should mention that all around do stuff description is a bit modest. Dave is the go-to guy for everything. Um, key organizer of Conversations and Connections. Um, that's a conference that I have a very dear connection with because that's the first place that I considered myself a writer. That's where I started calling myself a writer at Conversations and Connections. So it's a wonderful conference to be involved in now. Um, he does web updates, he does organizing, he does those amazing disco cat graphics you have seen <laughs> tweeted around on behalf of Barrel House. So he, uh, he you know, does many things in many uh, various aspects of Barrel House life. But tonight we are going to focus on Dave's own work. Um, and I'll just uh, read a little blurb just to sort of get us all sort of in the mood of what this book is about. And I'm just gonna take it straight from the book's own copy. It can speak for itself the best. Um, so I'll give this little introduction and then I'll ask Dave to read an excerpt uh, from the novel to kick us off. Um, I have some questions that we can start our conversation with, but as Zach mentioned, we do want to leave plenty of time for audience questions, so you can start putting those questions in at any point, like a lot of WTF, I can imagine, will come through the transom when Dave starts reading. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, so here is what the book is about. From award-winning author Dave Housley, what would you do if a group of your fellow office workers won the lottery? The Other Ones tracks the actions and reactions of multiple characters in the wake of this cataclysmic event, tracing the effect it has on them for good and bad over the following year. Some dig in, some quit, some go more than a little crazy. One commits suicide by jumping off the roof of the office, that's the character I was talking about, Yoder, a little earlier, then returns as a ghost to haunt the winners. So that is not a spoiler. That happens fairly early on. Funny, tragic, and real, The Other Ones shines a light on our contemporary relationships to money, work, and one another. Um, so that is a little glimpse into what this book is all about. And um, now I'd like to ask Dave to read us an excerpt to whet our appetites and start our conversation. So I'll hand it over to Dave. All right, thanks, Tara. Um, first, I wanna say thanks to Tara for agreeing to do this. Um, Really appreciate it. And thanks to the Writer Center for hosting us. I, I told Amy this afternoon that the Writer Center is the first place I ever took a writing class as a grown up adult. So it, it was the way that I actually tried to start doing this. So I really appreciate it. It's really cool to kind of be back. It'd be better if we were in person, but um, it's very cool to be hosted by you all. So Zach, Amy, Emily, and Margaret, thank you very much. Um, and thanks to everyone who's here. We appreciate you taking a little time out of your day to, to be here and learn a little bit more about the book. Um, I'll give the only setup I think I have to give to this is that 
Uh, the book is told uh, from the points of view of seven different characters. And there are short chapters from each point of view and it rotates through them, I think pretty regularly in the same order. Um, so I'm gonna read a couple chapters uh, from the very beginning of the book when they're all coming into the office and finding out that their coworkers won the lottery. Um, the chapters are named after the characters. So um, the first one is called Chastain. Oh, also I'm gonna swear a lot. So if you don't like that, you're you're in the wrong place, I'm afraid. So I said on Twitter, I'm gonna say the word asshole at least six times in this uh, six minutes that I'm reading this excerpt. So be ready for that, trigger, trigger alert. Um, okay, this is called Chastain. Those jackasses won the fucking lottery? She says it out loud and then looks around, but there's nobody in the hallway, nobody in the office yet. They're all either celebrating in the conference room or gossiping in the kitchen, the hallways, and the entrances to their cubicles. She checks the clock. Craver Wall must certainly be late. She realizes she is looking forward to telling him, to commiserating, sneaking down the back steps and smoking a parliament late and talking about what assholes they are, how ridiculous everything is, whether they should start drinking at lunch or wait until happy hour. Good God, those assholes won the lottery. She is not sure whether she is going to burst out laughing or throw up right here on her keyboard. She stares at her computer. She checks her phone again. She owes $29,560 on her student loans, $2,623 on the visa, $3,400 on the MasterCard. She's not sure if the X on her Kohl's card still exists, but she imagines there would be at least 500 or so on each of them. She remembers seeing the Macy's logo and the number 800 something or other. The lottery. Those assholes. She stands up and sits down. Garner waddles by, talking into his phone. He has a folder in his hands and a little bounce in his step. She always thought it was so typical. These idiots tithing themselves to the state in the most stupid possible way. Two dollars here, a dollar there, a hundred bucks a year that could go somewhere else. Would she have missed a hundred dollars a year? She puts the thought out of her head. Those assholes, the lottery. Jesus, they really are the worst of the entire company. Almost every old or middle-aged man who skeeves her out, checks her ass as she walks by, stares in meetings, watches as she bends down to pick up a post-it off the floor. Almost all of them are in the lottery group. She plays through them in her head. Mowry, Cowens, Pappas, Zuba, Fitzgerald. A thought hits her and she actually sits up straight and puts her hand on her chest. Craver, did Craver play? This chapter is called Craver. He pauses at the door and checks the time on his phone. He's not too late. Hopefully he can slip through without Lawson or worse, Sarah noticing anything. He checks his phone, Twitter notification, two Facebook messages, a few emails. He pushes the door open slowly and nods to Chastain. You here yet, she says, what? He is still breathing heavy from the stairs. A line of sweat runs down his side. Chastain has her hair curly today. She'll tell him later that she didn't have time to dry it, that she looks like a crazy person. She'll tap at her cigarette and shake her head and tell him she is going to stop smoking, apply to graduate school, look in a CrossFit or Orange Theory or the Y. He will nod and swallow the compliment welling up in every part of him. You look great. You always look great. And offer her another cigarette. Anything to spend another 10 minutes listening to her complain about her friends and the office and the ridiculous things the bachelor or the bachelorette has done now. She stands and gestures to the hall. You're not going to fucking believe this, she says, a pang of real emotion creeping into her voice. It is unfamiliar and he wonders if somebody died. Wait, she says, did you play last week with those assholes? Play? He notices for the first time a strange sound in the office, laughter, shouting, music, party sounds coming from another part of the floor. The lottery, the fucking lottery, I think, he says. The lottery, did he play the lottery? He's a part-timer with the lottery. Sometimes he plays and sometimes he doesn't, and it depends mostly on whether he happens to have $2 in his wallet at the exact time when Garner sends the email. You think? You think? Those assholes won $8.8 8 .8 million per asshole. So you better figure out if you played. Jesus Christ, you might be a fucking millionaire, you asshole. I need a cigarette, she says. Craver watches her walking back to the desk, opening the drawer, tipping the pack. Did he play the lottery? He remembers the email. Garner always includes him, even though he doesn't always play. Did he get the confirmation email? 
Did you get Garner's scan of the tickets and the standard rundown about how when we win, we will take the cash payout and not release our names? Jesus, did he play the fucking lottery last week or not? There he is. Craver jumps. Fuck, another one, Chastain says. Mowry is standing right there, wearing jeans and a Toby Keith t-shirt. He is holding a beer and an envelope. There he is, he says again. He holds his envelope up to Craver. Better go get one of these, he says, and then holds the beer up. And one of these, too. He comes closer, holds a palm up for a high five. Chastain taps a cigarette out of the pack and puts it in her mouth. I might have to smoke this right here in this goddamn office today, she says. Mowry laughs. Don't think anybody would care too much today, he says. He turns to Craver, pushes the hand further up toward his face. Don't leave me hanging, buddy, he says. Craver taps his hand, his mind still turning. Mowry pushes his hand up to the sky and makes an explosion sound. Craver almost pauses to explain that this isn't how high fives work, but decides against anything that might prolong the interaction. Well, come on, man, Mowry says. We're all over in the conference room. I have to, Craver says. Did he get the confirmation email? You don't have to do jack shit, man. Not anymore, Mowry says. None of us do. Well, sorry, Jenny. Chastain gives him the finger and takes out her lighter. Mowry laughs. Craver doesn't really like the way he is looking at Chastain, like he is considering something. Fuck this, Chastain says. She lights the cigarette and exhales. Craver reaches out and she hands it to him. He takes a deep draw, feels the cool scrape in his lungs. Okay, let's go, he says. I'm going, Chastain nods towards the stairs. See you in the usual, Craver says. Yeah, yeah, she says. And he worries briefly that she is annoyed. And then Mowry punches him in the shoulder and starts out toward the hallway. His feet feel funny. His head is fuzzy. Did he play? Did he get the confirmation email? The music and the shouting get louder as he gets closer to the conference room. He feels like he is floating, like he is a balloon attached to Mowry following him through the door, holding his hand up for high fives, feeling the slaps on his back. Somebody hands him a beer and he puts it back down. He checks his phone. It is 9.18 on Monday morning and he is a 30-year-old marketing associate and maybe his life has just completely changed. Garner is in the corner handing an envelope to Miller, who Craver didn't even think worked here anymore. He looks at Craver and nods, then takes another look at the papers in front of him and turns quickly, too quickly. Garner stands. He is walking toward Craver. Did he play? Did he get the confirmation email? Hey man, Garner says. He places a hand on Craver's shoulder. Craver notices the spots on his glasses, the mole on the side of his neck. He holds up a piece of paper and all Craver sees is a list of names, handwritten in Garner's teenagery bubble handwriting. You didn't play last week, he says. That's it. Wow. I love it. I love it. Hearing you, you read. Uh, I mean, you know, hearing an author read sometimes changes the way that you understand the book. But with you, the way you write, it's so much like natural spe speech patterns anyway. The dialogue comes straight off the page, the way you can imagine real people speaking. Um, and so at, even as I just read it off the page, I could hear these people sort of wondering and thinking in fragments and noticing these details and then coming back to the original question and this kind of recursive thinking that we all do um and you know so so even before i heard you read i could hear the dialogue in my head um but hearing you read it of course is even better that's fantastic thank you. so thank you for that. Oh my gosh, yeah. No, thank you for getting us off to this running start. Wonderful start. Um, and there was already a question in the chat and it was the first question I asked as well um, about this seven POV character uh, structure that you've used, kind of like an ensemble cast approach. And you know, anyone who has written a, a book or even a short story has probably received the advice that do you really need all those characters you're interested in? Do you really need all these POV characters? You know, it's like the number one piece of advice between that and does the story really start here? So, um, so I'll combine this question, uh, Max's question in the chat with my own. Um, how did you balance your desire to have this ensemble cast with all these layered experiences against the advice that we usually get as authors to streamline for the sake of readers? And um, Max's part, point of that is how did you um, 
do that while keeping the flow of the plot going while breaking the book up into so many different POV characters. So how did you handle all of those characters? Good question. I actually, I, I was just away on a little writing retreat and looked at the um, the shitty first draft I'm working on right now of a different book. And I was trying to figure out why it was getting so confusing. And I had 17 POV characters in that one. So <laughs> this was like my training, I guess, for trying to write that book. But that, that one may be the, the one that proves the rule that you actually shouldn't do that. Um, I think if in this one, there a couple different things. One is that the, the initial idea was was really a, a multi-character idea. And it was basically, you know, what what would you do if your coworkers won the lottery? Um, we have a group in my office that plays the lottery. And when we were in the office, I played it all the time. And it was mostly because I was terrified of this moment that I would walk in and hear like music playing and realize that I didn't play and the rest of them did. So it was based out of this fear I had. And the, the idea was really, what would, what would different people do? And I kind of always pictured them just shooting off in these directions, you know? Um, and, and the seven of them shoot off in different directions. So I, the basic idea was one that I thought needed um, at least a lot of POV characters. Initially, there were there were five initially, and then the the angry asshole ghost kind of came in later. And then there's also a guy who just sits at his desk and thinks about like lunch and fantasy football. And he's a very realistic character in my experience with offices, but he came in um, in a second draft actually. So I at first it was just really an extension of the initial idea, which was let's what would happen if this if this really happened in a workplace and what kind of weird directions would people shoot off into? And then a couple other like just one very nuts and bolts thing is I wrote most of this book over lunch hours um, from my office job at Wegmans. And I get an hour for lunch. It takes 10 minutes to get to Wegmans. It takes 10 minutes to get back to my office. So I had like 35 good writing minutes. So these are short chapters. And a, a lot of them are longer than you could write in 35 minutes. But that first one I read, I probably... I probably wrote that whole thing literally at lunch at Wegmans. So part of the fact that it, the chapters are short is a side effect of, of my kind of my writing practice at the time, which was mostly that was the time available to me. So that's when I wrote. Um, and I also read a lot of crime fiction. So that's one thing that you tend to see in crime fiction is a lot of the back and forth POVs, especially Elmore Leonard. I've read, read a lot of Elmore Leonard. And I think he, he, does, he does that. So when I started trying to write novels, I think because I had kind of you know, learned that, that way of constructing a novel from crime novels, this kind of multi POV just kind of was something that was comfortable to me. And it was just kind of the, the structure that my brain was locked on to in terms of how a novel works. I think it really is from reading so much of those crime novels. Yeah. Well, and the form also kind of follows the function when you talk about sort of the limited amount of time people have to really think for themselves at an office setting. Mm -hmm. um, so that form captures that sort of truncated time that one has to be oneself in an office setting. Um, so it really adds to that feeling of limitation. Um, and these folks that have, you know, the assholes that have, you know, blasted beyond these limitations with the money. <laughs> Um, and I have the title for your craft book. It's Lunch at Wegmans. That's, that's <laughs> the title for your craft book. So. <laughs> All right. Tuck that one away. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, so we do have some more questions coming in. I'll just ask uh, maybe just one more um, before I leap in and make sure we catch them all in the chat. Um, I did want to talk about this blend of fantastical elements and these absolutely mundane life experiences like the work world. Um, so in this case, this is uh, the fantastical element is this asshole ghost you keep talking about, um, who interestingly does have an arc. Like the, the thing about these seven characters is some of them change over the course of the book and some don't. And it's really interesting to see how these people react and change um, or don't, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's not just one kind of, 
um, you know, a development arc for everybody. Um, definitely not one size fits all. But so in this case of this fantastical element of this ghost trying to figure out the rules of this new afterlife, right? But he has to do it in the most banal of settings, usually in somebody's kitchen. Um, and the homes of the lottery winners for the most part. Um, so, and, and this is something that you've done really just fantastically in your other books too, sort of building in the weird and the normal around it. So how do you achieve that blend of fantastical and banal? Um, do you start, tend to start with the weird and then build a normal world around it? Or do you tend to start with the everyday and then find yourself introducing a fantastical element um, as a way of kind of shaking things up? Good question. I, I tend to start with the, the everyday, like the, the normal, um, you know, normal frustrations that, that people might be having. I, I think like regret in jealousy or like my, my lanes, you know, where I'm, no matter what I write, those, those things kind of come back to it. Um, so I always start with, with a normal thing, a normal setting and, and kind of it's grounded in those, those, those things. And then for this one, um, initially my idea of the book was that it was just going to start with him jumping off the building, but he wasn't going to come back as a ghost. And even in the early writing of the book, it it got it it needed a little comic element. It needed a little kind of something to zhuzh it up a little bit. And I just had a a real um, moment where I thought, oh my god, like he could come back as a ghost in the lottery winners' houses. So it served a really functional purpose of also showing us what happens to them, like what weird directions they shoot off in. Um, and they're mostly assholes, so they're mostly doing the most ridiculous stuff for this money. You know, one of them buys like an indoor hot tub that he has to connect with a, a big orange utility uh, connect um, outlet. And one of them buys like a thousand dollars worth of scratch off lottery tickets and they buy all these ridiculous things from Best Buy. So he's just completely enraged most of the time by what he finds that they're doing with the money. So like just structurally that gave me a really great opportunity to show kind of also their progress and the dumb things they were doing. And then they get sad kind of halfway through too. Um, or you see some of them getting sad. Like one guy buys a Kentucky fried chicken and it just makes him sad. Um, one guy just cries in the middle of the night while he's watching friends. So it, it was just structurally gave me a really great opportunity to, to track them as well. Um, and also I thought it was an opportunity to, to add just an element of weirdness, something that maybe you wouldn't expect in a book like this, like an office kind of workplace book. And also I think he's pretty funny. Um, he's kind of funny, angry, sad, which is my favorite combination of things. And he kind of, you know, he, he lands kind of in this new workplace and mostly what he's upset about is the workplace conditions. Uh, there's no onboarding materials. There's he, he wishes there was a webinar and he doesn't have a computer and nobody there to explain the rules to him. So I, I thought that was a good opportunity <laughs> to like insert some dark humor into, you know, what is a pretty, pretty dark and hopefully pretty humorous story, but also to, to do it in a different kind of way. So that, that to me was like a real light bulb moment when I thought, oh, this, this could serve all these different purposes and be you know fun to write because every time his his number came up, I was pretty psyched to sit down and and write that one. Maybe stayed a little longer in my lunch at Wegmans to, to finish up those chapters. <laughs> so when you say his number came up, did you have kind of a structure of like who when you wanted people to come in, or was it more organic that just whenever it came up, you know, inspirationally? I think it follows a pretty consistent um, pattern with the. The chapters and how they rotate throughout. I'm not a hundred percent sure. In fact, Hannah, who was on here, um, I think probably knows better than I do if I was consistent with that. <laughs> Hi, <Okay>. Hannah. <laughs> but I, I think I think I was. 
Okay, cool, 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 cool. Now I said I was just gonna ask that one more question, but I lied because I do wanna get to this question and then I will come back to the chat and make sure I get everybody. Um, but I did wanna ask this question about female characters because this is something that Dave is so wonderful at, making three-dimensional real human being female characters. Um, Chastain, I, I saw in the chat, that was uh, what, you know, one of the people's favorite characters there. She's fantastic. Um, and you know they the the female characters in, in all of Dave's you know books and stories like get to be people with their own motivations and opinions that may or may not have anything to do with the men in their lives. You know they get to do their own things. Um, when they are in relationships, they're often depicted as the smarter and more capable ones. <laughs> and so I was wondering if you could tell us how that tendency of actual human beings for women in your books, <laughs> how that came about. Um, was this like osmosis from from like influences from other women in your life or was it something that you consciously worked on um so how did those women come about in your work well i really appreciate that tara especially coming from you um i mean i guess first of all i i like women um <laughs> i've always had lots of friends who are women so i i think it it maybe it, it uh i mean growing up as a boy and a man you realize how many heterosexual men don't really like women. So um, that is that is just, got, I think, a, kind of a starting place <laughs> for me. Um, and I think, you know, in this one, there really are the two best people in the book are women. Um, I do kind of believe that the women are smarter in general, um, as the old song says. Um, and here, I, I think I, I was really just trying to make sure that they were, like you said, kind of flesh and blood characters that she winds up actually kind of breaking up with this guy who's actually completely fine, but just because they have a disagreement about, about work, actually. Uh, so I really, you know, just wanted to present her as a flesh and blood character in this office place. And she's probably the one who changes the most and the only one probably who changes for the better. <laughs> um, but I also think, you know, I, I wasn't trying to write some story that represented all women in the workplace because I'm not a person who's capable of doing that. Um, and I've worked in enough offices to understand some of what a person like that would be dealing with. Um, and some of that was in that first chapter. Um, but I kind of was mostly trying to represent like a flesh and blood person who takes this turn in how she looks at, at her work and her career more so than, you know, not trying to, to represent something I, I couldn't possibly understand. So uh, maybe yeah. just taking a smaller swing at it um, yeah. paid off, yeah. Yeah, well, and she has an arc that she happens to be a woman, but it's a universal arc. It could happen to a man or a woman, mm -hmm. just sort of discovering your um, capabilities, right? Once Absolutely. the situation changes, you realize you can change. Um, so it didn't have to be a woman, but it was a woman. And it, that's that's the kind of sort of equal opportunity arc that, you know, that that you do so well. Um, you don't really pin appreciate a that. specific gender into a specific storyline. So, um, so yeah, Chastain was, was a boss. Um, <laughs> and that links to a question in the chat from Hannah. Um, who is the hero in this book? Is there one? It's a good question. I mean, I, I think she would be, she's the most admirable character. Um, and she really leans into work and kind of, there's a layer of irony that she has when the book starts and she's not really taking anything seriously. And she, that kind mm -hmm. of comes off of her a little bit. So yeah. I think she's the most admirable one. There's the, the old guy character as well, who, um, goes through a real cycle of anger and resentment and kind of comes Muscle. out the other side at the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think he's another one that I, I think it happens later for him, but I think he's also hopefully kind of an admirable character. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, kind of, it's a real ensemble. So I, yeah. I don't know that there's one, um, you know, a single hero of the book. Um, but she's she's the person who comes through it the best and deals with it the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Absolutely, I think the audience agrees. Um, there's another question in the chat, uh, Max, piggybacking off of Hannah's question about the hero. Um, is there a character who is at the core of the book and did it change the way you conceived of the whole? Um, so maybe was there one you started with and did it morph or did, you know, how did that process work for you? The, the couple, like I, I, like I said, I thought of this about what different directions people might shoot off in. And the ones that I started with were there's a character Craver. He was in that second section who um, winds up driving across the country, he tries to convince Chastain to go with him, and she turns him down. Um, and then so he drives across the country. That was that was there from the very beginning. I knew someone was going to try to do that. I think these are like things that I thought, well, if I was 30 and didn't have a family and this thing happened at work how might I react? Like what are the, the worst, what's the worst way I could react? And that's probably how he winds up going. And then the best way would be what Chastain winds up doing. I knew I, I wanted the flip side of that and someone to kind of lean into work. Um, it, it started with the Yoder, with the, the angry ghost uh, who leaps off the building. And then for me, he was really the thread uh, throughout because he's, he's tracking what's happening outside of the POV characters, which is an important part of the book. Um, so to me, like he was kind of the central thread. He pulled kind of both sides together and um, also served a lot of plot because he could go places and hear people talking about what was going to happen next. So he was really a key um, yeah. element in terms of, of how the book was structured and how the plot wound up working. And there's, there's like a lot of plot in this book for for me, at least, <laughs> um, a lot of stuff happens. So it, it was really important to have a character who could be in rooms while the lottery winners were talking and just show up in lots of different places. So he was kind of a key to how it fit together. Right, right. Um, so I have a uh, request in the chat to hold up the cover. And since I do not have Ooh, a physical have. copy of the book, if you wouldn't mind doing that, um, and I am going to just make sure I'm not missing any other questions while you do that. Um, I'll say I it's, have. It's really cool because every character, we got to choose a kind of a title font for every character. Oh. And it was awesome. super fun to be able to do that. That was like kind of a weird nerd dream come true, I would say. Oh, wow. Okay. So I did not was, have that in my version. That's yeah, awesome. The book is beautiful. Very cool the Alan Squire, Rose and, and Hannah and everybody there did an amazing job with the physical object of the book. It's really beautiful. Amazing. I can't wait to get back home and have it when I, when I get home. Um, so continue to put your questions in the chat. I do have another one that um, swerved a little bit from this particular book because yeah, I do want to talk about more of your books um, because you have many amazing ones. And um, I thought I would talk uh, or ask about the, the question of writing toward a theme. Like when you're writing a novel, you're usually mm -hmm. writing around a central problem or set of issues, right? And it's, it's like this uniform project. Um, but even in your collections, you have this way of writing around a theme. Like you've got commercial fiction, which is all about commercials and massive cleansing fire, which is organized around massive cleansing fires. And, um, you know, if I knew the way I would take you home around music. And so um, how do you um, get that sense of unity in a collection? Do you find that you write a certain critical mass and they say, oh, hey, I can put these together, or does the concept come first? How does that process generally work for you? Well, I'm going to ask you the same question at the end of this, because I know <laughs> you do the same thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, I like to have a writing project, especially with short stories, to have um, you know a, a group of short stories that all have, you know, like you said, a similar element. I did a, a Looney Tunes project a couple of years ago, um, so it's, it's fun for me to have a project that I'm working on where all the stories kind of hang together in a certain way. And our friend, Chris Gonzalez, I think is on here. Chris could give this answer. Cause I, I, uh, had many, um, 
end of the night talks with Chris where I kind of harangued him that this is this is a good approach. <laughs> so sorry, Chris. Um, but yeah, I, I like to, I, I think it does a couple of things. One is it's almost like you've given yourself a writing prompt for a collection of stories. So um, you can kind of usually come up with the next idea for a story pretty easily. I and mean, when I was working on the Looney Tunes project, I would literally just Google Looney Tunes and kind of watch some YouTube videos and then get an idea for, oh, a Porky Pig story. Um, so it, it's a really, to me, it, it's been a useful way to organize my writing in that I usually have a writing prompt in front of me. Um, and then once I have a group of stories together, I find it's, it, it's maybe easier to pitch a group of stories that have some collect connective tissue than it is to say, hey, these were these are a bunch of good stories and this one was published here and this one was published there, this one was published there. Um, now that's that's worked out well for me in the small press and kind of medium press world. Um, I haven't been able to expand, you know, out of that world. So if you want to sell your your story collection to one of the big three or however many there are now, this, that may not be a great approach, but it's worked well for me. And I know uh, at Barrel House, when we talk about books, uh, we've never published a story collection, but um, you know, there's that, I, it's a little easier to understand what a book like that is about. If you can say, this is a book of stories all based on television commercials. Um, and it might cut through the noise a little bit. It's, you know, certain publishers, um, easy to understand, different, something that's a little quirky maybe. Um, I think it helps in that way too. And it's, it, so it's kind of a functionally something that helps me continue to keep writing stories. And then at least like knock on wood, historically mm -hmm. it's been, I don't want to say easier, but it's, you know, publishers seem to have been receptive to that idea of like, this is a group of stories around this theme. So what about you, Tara? <laughs> You're turning the tables here. My you just gosh. you just published that awesome uh, doll collect doll collection yeah, last year, and I know yeah, you're working on like collection. city stories right now. Yeah, you know, I think for me, it is not so much a plan, a cohesive strategy, as it is just my compulsive, obsessive personality. <laughs> um, so if I'm freaked out about dolls, I'm freaked out for a reason, and I'm going to be freaked out more than one night. <laughs> so. For me, it's just more organic, but um, but yeah, it you know once you do have a critical mass, then I think it becomes easier to sort of see where these stories are heading, and and how they might fit together. But um, yes, I wish I were more organized so as to have the idea from from the start or close to the start, I, like you seem to. I think for me, it started off like very organically, and then it became more of a way to organize around a book, and also to kind of take advantage of. The time I do have to write to try to like, okay, if I'm going to write a short story, I'm going to try to write one that's going to build on a collection rather than just kind of willy nilly, you know, it's so it's been a kind of an organizing structure for me, I think. Right. Very, very smart. Um, that uh, what you just said relates to another question I saw in the in the chat about time management. Um, Colleen asked how long it took to complete the book, this one that we're talking about tonight, um, basically dedicating time during lunch. So how long did that whole project stretch out? I think, I think this one was about a year and, and I was much more focused on this book than I had been on any other book. Um, I think partially because I just, I thought it was a good idea straight through. <laughs> I just kept on thinking. This is a good idea for a book, which is not my usual um, thing. I don't usually, usually I'm writing a little weirder stuff, but I felt like it was a good idea. And it just, it, it, writing the short chapters, I think it really pushed it along. Um, mm -hmm. So it's about a year to write a shitty first draft and then uh, maybe a half a year of editing until I felt okay to start, you know, trying to get it published basically. Right. Well, and let's talk about publishing. Um, just to let folks know where we are in terms of time, um, we have raffle winners, so we can introduce those. We will have introduce those before the hour is done. Um, 
please do, if you have any questions uh, uh, built up, and if I haven't seen them yet, just please do put it there again. I think I am caught up, but if I'm not, just go ahead and, and repeat that question in the chat. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'll ask at least one more question before we head to the raffle winners, but, um, but this issue of publishing, um, could you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, you did mention um, about this idea of a themed story collection perhaps being a better fit for a small publisher. Um, but could you talk about your, mm -hmm. you know, quest to publish this particular book? <laughs> yeah, this I, I've never had an agent. And, you know, mostly, I've at least told myself it's because I wasn't writing agent books. Um, I tried to get an agent with my vampire Grateful Dead book about a vampire that's on the last Grateful Dead tour. If you do that, you will find out that an equal number of agents hate the Grateful Dead or vampires. It's 100% of all agents hate either one of those groups. So yeah, it was a Venn diagram like this of the agents who hated half of my book. So <laughs> this one, I, I really thought, like I said, I, I, I felt like this is a pretty good idea for a book. And when I would see people and they'd ask what I was writing, I, I could tell them and not feel like an asshole. You know, they feel like, well, it's a book about a people, group of people whose coworkers win the lottery. Um, to me, it sounded like a good idea for a book. And I thought, I really thought it might be an agent book, you know, and the definition of an agent book is really a, a book that an agent thinks they can sell to a large publisher. Uh, so I thought maybe. Um, so I tried that route first. Um, I looked at my my spreadsheet before this. Um, I sent it out to 57 agents over the course of about six months. And there might be people on this uh, Zoom who were like, he barely scratched the surface, you know? Um, but there might be people who are horrified I stuck with it that long. I, I don't really know what an average is, but I got to the point where there was no reason I was sending it to this person other than their name showed up on a list and they had an email address. Um, I was just completely blind querying. And I also realized that I, I could have done that forever. Like if that could have gone on, I could still be doing that literally um, and have gotten up to, you know, 400, 500 agents that rejected it. Um, but for me, which is something, you know, this is kind of, something you have to figure out on your own, you know, as a writer, um, when to pull the plug on that, uh, when to stick with it. Uh, so for me, I was just like, I, this makes no sense. And I could just do this forever. And I'm just going to transition to starting to send this to small presses. Um, so I had a list, you know, it, and that group changes at any given time, who might be open or closed for submissions. So I had a list of maybe 30 or 40 um, small presses that accepted unagented submissions. And I was kind of tracking when they opened. I think I, I got rejected by maybe 10. And then Alan Squire was open at you know the right time and they connected with the book. So really, really happy ending to what was a pretty, pretty long and winding road. And and near the end there, I was starting to, to try to get myself to come to grips with the idea that it just might not ever find a publisher, that this this might be one that I stick in a drawer and move on to the next one. I was really, and in fact, I did a podcast, my friend Mike Ingram has a podcast called Day Jobs, and I did Mike's podcast right around that time, maybe a month before um, Alan Squire, heard back from Alan Squire, and talked a lot about like, I'm trying to get my head around this. This one just may not work. You know, maybe the marketplace is not there for this book. So um, I'm obviously really, really pleased with how that all came out. But um, but yeah, there was there was a period of time when I was really not sure if this was going to be more than a word file on my computer. Yeah, absolutely. I was ready to strip Trevolution for parts and just try and make a short story out of the 60,000 mm -hmm. words I'd written. <laughs> and yeah. then a small publisher came through. So hooray for small publishers. Yes. Because they're willing to take risks on things that fall in between categories and do things other books don't do. So um, much love and admiration and thanks to small publishers. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I do have another question or two, but I want to make sure that we get our raffle winners announced so they can be all happy and excited with us. So Zach is ready to read off those names right now. Yes, congratulations to our two raffle winners. We have uh, Brianna Maley and Colleen Franklin. Again, that's Brianna and Colleen are our two winners. I'll send you a quick message, direct message in the chat window. If you just respond to that with your email address, I will then contact you via email for all the pertinent details. Congratulations, you won the lottery. Yes, we have a lottery winner here today. <laughs> Uh, back to the real talk. I'm done. Uh, I'll okay, but, well, wait a minute. There's a good joke about winning the lottery here, Dave. Oh I my God! Yes. Book. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so we all can like be bitter about them together <laughs> in this, <laughs> in this uh, talk, in this book talk. Let's all shoot um, off in bad directions. Yes, absolutely. Although, like maybe 20% of us can, you know, do something better with our lives <laughs> after that. Fair. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, if anyone else questions, please uh, get them in there before we're out of time. Um, I do have a question, um, just more about publishing novels. Um, I, I, you have co-written novels with um, Becky Barnard, a very good Barrel House, wonderful, do everything as well um, behind the scenes. So um, talk to us a little bit about um, those books you've written, um, that process, um, and you know the pros and cons that you have encountered with co-writing a novel. Sure, um, it was really fun. <laughs> Becky and I wrote a book called The Grays that's coming out this summer um, about an alien girl in an Indiana high school. Um, so it, I had, I think, maybe two pages of a story, I, you know, and, and I, I felt like the idea was really good and shared it with Becky. And she said, that's amazing because every teenage girl feels like an alien. And I was just like, oh, wow, we should write this together because I don't know what it feels like to be a teenage girl. Um, so, and, and Becky and I, it, it was, I don't want to say easy, but maybe easier for, for her and I, we tend to look at things the same way and come at a lot of things the same way. Um, so uh, we wound up like just on a nuts and bolts level, we had a Google doc and just bounce the Google doc back and forth. So one of us would kind of write a scene, the other one would finish it. One of us would start another scene, the other one would finish it. And we really just bounce back and forth like that, uh, straight through a, a shitty first draft. Um, and it was really fun. I think I, I brought um, white male overconfidence to the project and Becky brought Midwestern work ethic and writing talent. So <laughs> you can guess which one of us was more important to that uh, duo. <laughs> <laughs> So you've written how many of these books? Is it a series? We, we wrote, yeah, we wrote the first one, which comes out in the summer. And then we have a contract to, for, it's a series. So we need to decide whether, you know, they, they usually want three. We need to decide whether it's, whether it's just one more or whether it's two more. Um, we had written, <laughs> to, Becky and I had co-written a really dirty paranormal erotica with our friend Matt Perez, another Barrel House editor. Oh gosh, I uh, can't imagine how he would get involved <laughs> in something like that. <laughs> it's, on, it's on Amazon and it's called Touch Me. And the author's name is Apollonia Fox. So Becky and I had a little bit of experience with that. We, we bounced back and forth writing Touch Me with Perez. It's like a 20,000 word story about a an army veteran who's having an affair with the ghost of Jim Morrison. Um, and halfway through, Perez and I watched the Doors movie and realized like Jim Morrison was such a dick. So like halfway through, it takes this turn where Jim Morf Morrison, is, it doesn't work out well for the ghost of Jim Morrison, I will say, uh, but our, our protagonist has good fun with him. So, okay. so Be Becky um, and I had done a little bit of co-writing before. Um, so taking on the bigger project was was much more than that, but it was it was really fun. She's a I, I think she's on here too, and she's probably blushing, but she's a really great writer. <laughs> um, so it was really fun to kind of ride her coattails um, on that, and to to like open up the Google Doc any day and be like, oh, holy shit, that's beautiful. Um, yeah. 
it was really fun and, and also try to crack each other up a lot so <laughs> good motivation in that and so did you have a general plot line that you would loosely follow or did you just sort of go stream of consciousness and find a surprise in the google document or a little I bit I, <laughs> I think i drove becky crazy by not having a <laughs> plot line or an outline at all so i <laughs> I really can't write with any kind of outline. It, it just kind of sucks the life out of it for me. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure I drove her crazy, but we just kind of winged it. Okay, okay. Well, and you know, there is a craft um, <laughs> issue in Touch Me. I, 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 you know, maybe defying all craft uh, books, but uh, it, the, the role of research, when you mentioned that you watched that documentary in <laughs> yeah. the middle, Right. I think there's something to be said for not doing all of the research at the beginning because you kind of close close off avenues. Um, but you did research in the middle and it had this effect, you know, this broadening That's effect true. in it's the true. narrative. So yes. <laughs> Change the treatment of Jim Morrison in the book. I'll Absolutely. Say that. Great craft elements going into this <laughs> erotica ghost story. <laughs> um so we only have a couple of minutes left. So I want to make sure I am not seeing any more questions. So wh how, what would you like folks to know about the process, the craft or the publishing or any any part of this process of, of writing and publishing a book? I mean, I think just that idea, which I kind of evolved because when well, my son's 16 now, but he was younger, I didn't have much time. Um, they you don't need the whole day sitting in front of you in perfect conditions to kind of push something along. Um, you know, like I said, I wrote most of this Wegmans 40 minute bites or at the coffee shop in town, maybe Saturday breakfast. Um, but in a lot of ways, I, I think I'm more productive when I have that small amount of time because I don't have time to kind of screw around and check Twitter and do whatever else. I just have to sit there and yeah. get some writing done. And it it, it kind of helps to put yourself in positions where not writing would just be stupid. Where like, you're like <laughs> here I am by myself at Wegmans with my computer in front of me. Am I really gonna sit here and check Twitter on my phone or am I just gonna <laughs> write some shitty words for half an hour? Um, that's, so that's the first chapter of your craft book. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my craft talk. Absolutely. <laughs> you can do that. Take yourself to the bar and get a, fancy cocktail and write for 45 minutes. Um, yeah. That's really like, if I have anything to say in the way of craft, it's that. And the, the other is, I did want to talk about the process of publication because it got rejected a lot and it was mostly rejection until it wasn't at the end. Um, and that's, that's most people's experience, I think. So, you know, I think just don't get too frustrated by the frustrating process that, it, you know, you can, wind up finding just the right um, market for the book you have. Absolutely. Well, those are wonderful, hopeful words to, to end on. So I want to thank you for writing this fabulous book and for inviting me to, uh, you know, to be here for tonight. Thank you so much, um, Dave and, and the Writer Center and everyone who has come tonight and added to the conversation. Um, so I will go ahead and hand it back over to Zach to take us out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, everyone who is involved in this book. Thanks to my colleagues. Thanks to all of you who attended this evening. Uh, that's a wrap. <laughs>